good afternoon one and all. Uh, it is an extreme pleasure to hold this uh, PIC Adda today. And uh, we have with us a very esteemed guest, uh, Advocate Vaishali Bhagwat. Uh, she is not only a dear friend of mine, she is a highly accomplished uh, cybercrime lawyer. And we all have to uh, also invite her and welcome her on the Pune International Center platform. She has recently become the member of uh, PIC. Uh, she has got an illustrious uh, career. Uh, we all know, we must have all read it uh, when in the flyer. So she has done her uh, education from Pune University and later on from Cranfield University which is in UK. Uh, she has been a practicing lawyer for more than uh, 20 odd years now. And uh, she has uh, represented uh, the cyber crime uh, lawyer fraternity at not only national level but at international levels. So we are extremely happy to have you, Advocate Vaishali, here. Uh, she's a genuine friend of mine. We share a lot of common interests, but that's not the interest of this particular <laughs> forum. Um, today we will have a kind of a discussion with her. So she's going to draw talk on trending cyber crimes and the new Digital India Act. Uh, this is a very important topic. In fact, we have had one of the PIC attas earlier also on similar topics. However, the points that she is going to cover is not only restricted to the financial frauds, but also to the frauds in general which are related to uh, the adolescent uh, girls and boys, also related to women uh, and also related to the business fraternity. So, welcome Vaishali on this platform. Thank you very much. So, let us start with the actual topic that is trending cyber crimes. So, can you tell us uh, what are the top three uh, trending cyber crimes in our country. So we'll start with India and then probably we can expand. So first thank you Sangeeta and thank you everybody for having me here and also welcoming me into the PIC fraternity. It's a great privilege to be part of this very illustrious group. Uh, I've done a similar talk but as Sangeeta said it was concentrating on more on financial cyber frauds and the social media fire cyber frauds we, when we did the PIC Adda online I think in the COVID period. So it's a great honor to be here on a slightly different topic. Uh, so what I think what we'll do is looking at, uh, at the, the audience, uh, let me give a very overarching view of what kinds of crimes are the, the trending crimes and then we'll eventually look at what the law and the insufficiencies in the law also in the investigating mechanisms that are existing in the country. I'm conscious that PIC is also a think tank where we eventually should be influencing policy and I'm hoping that with maybe good discussions around this topic, we eventually will be have some inputs to be given to METI or um, uh, the in ministries involved where we can sort of push towards a maybe a bit better infrastructure for not only better investigation of cyber crimes but an effective solution to the uh, problems that we seem to have now. So coming back to the question Sangeeta about uh, trending cyber crimes, if I have to give you a like in like a one line answer, the crimes are relating to primarily greed the person's greed of wanting to make more money, maybe simple uh, innocence, negligence or uh, a mindset which is very callous. That's another reason why people are getting defrauded for large amounts of money. So first I said it's greed, second is absolute callousness or innocence. I, I don't want to use the word innocence, it's more negligence and callousness. The third is wanting to get into some form of a relationship, either a formal relationship like marriage or wanting to fall in love or it could be lust. So in some form of a personal interactions that uh, people uh, want to get into in an online forum and then they get defrauded eventually with money or there's emotional distress. I'll just wait a yeah. little bit. For how popular you are, Vaishali? I'm so. I started talking about Saturday. I don't know what that did outside. I didn't do it. Let's just push this. Let's just get this. 
so we're talking of greed we're talking of um, wanting to get into a relationship the third is fear most of the times we see that again large chunks of money people are losing because they're put under some form of threat and that threat is for them real and i'm going to give you uh, some examples of how real those threats can be you heard the term digital arrests and how people are getting conned for again large sums of money um very recently the pattern that we are seeing is uh, there are these investment scams now when when i say investment scams where uh, there is a, a portal or there is a whatsapp community there could be a facebook community where you are given advice to invest uh, in certain stocks and shares initially you will also get proper returns once you start believing in those returns and the people who are giving you advice for uh, those kind of investments then they the they are asking you to shift to a platform uh, an app uh, on which you can start trading you can start investing you can look at your investments you can look at your returns on that particular app when this gentleman came to my office uh, saying that he's lost about 90 lakhs in this share trading scam he was not even sure whether he had lost it he was saying that you know i have these 90 lakhs there i'm unable to retrieve it they are those people are not responding and that too he had realized when one of his accounts were, was frozen there was a debit freeze on his account by some police of a police department from madhya pradesh that is the time he sort of uh, realized that there is something bigger than what he is looking at when we when we looked at his statements and when we looked at what sort of investments he had done he realized that the account was frozen because there were some credit entries which had come into his accounts from um, uh, operators who were already part of a fir as an accused now how did that money come into his account because he was trading on this sort of alleged share trading platform so when i asked him that sir you've invested over a period of one year one and a half year uh, do all these reflect in your dmat account can you show me your dmat statement and uh, he said no no those shares don't appear in my dmat and with whatever little knowledge i have about all this i thought this was a very basic requirement right that if you're actually buying and selling shares it should reflect on your particular dmat now this person why i'm giving you this example because we all have this sense that it's not about us it's about some stupid people somewhere out who are you know falling prey to such scam so he is a person who is retired as a cfo of a very large organization in telco mm-hmm. now some somebody who knows more about finance than would i would know i really had to spend a lot of time just trying to figure out you know how all that happened now there's a sudden hurry to get the money back so let me file a fir i will go and meet the madhya pradesh police i will go to the cyber crime cell in pune uh, to get the money back but once there is a debit freeze on the account and once the money has gone out of your hands the the money that is going out of the country is at a very large speed now even if it is not going out of the country even within the country this money is getting withdrawn again at a very large speed and hence re- the chances of recovery are very low in such scams it's very unfortunate that even when clients come to us are we really are we are, are we in a position to offer some real relief to them unfortunately the answer is no because there's no money left mm. the money quickly changes hands and either goes out of the country or is going out to the the the, the fraudsters who are in an organized syndicate of uh, carrying out these financial frauds we'll come back to the law and you know what we can do a little later i'm just trying to put things in perspective and again things about it's about you and me and it is not about somebody outside the room or somebody you know that who are, who's less educated or who doesn't have really have um, knowledge of how the world works very commonly we see mat- what we call as matrimonial scams where women are largely targeted and the women are educated they have their own money uh, they could be um, uh, that they could be 
uh, in an age group of 30 plus where there's also a lot of pressure of getting married or there could be divorces or single women uh, uh, of an advanced stage. So it's a very targeted scam. Now in these scams, the first way in which the women are targeted is there's a relationship of trust that is built. Because you know, earlier in, even earlier in my career, I have been guilty a little bit about victim blaming. So when these women used to come, so I got the first case that I was referred to in, in this matter was uh, by the Maharashtra cyber cell from Bombay and uh, this lady was in Pune and she had lost 85 lakhs in this fraud. And my first reaction was, what were you doing? What were you thinking when you transferred so much money to a completely unknown person? But today when I see these women, uh, I realize that for them it is real. It is a real relationship. It is a real uh, bond and they are building on it. It is also another form of empowerment. You know what women are now thinking, oh I have the money and actually I can help you. So when we talk of gender equality, women's equality, this is another form of empowerment. They are no longer dependent. In fact, they are the ones who are the givers. And this is what is getting exploited. Uh, I think we, I can talk about the wedding.com uh, series that which has uh, just come out. Do watch that. It is on Amazon Prime mm -hmm. and it is directed by Tanuja Chandra and where we have interviewed real victims and real women who have fallen prey to uh, these scams where the relationship of trust is built not only over a period of months but it can be period of over years. And finally, the man strikes by using this uh, emotional um, blackmail where the women, under different, um, for different various reasons, this money can go out. It could be because, uh, uh, you know, he's saying that I've sent gifts to you. They're, they're in the customs department. Why don't you pay so much so that, you know, that can be released. You'll be given an RBI certificate. And all those are very real documents to look at and to believe that this is happening. I had one uh, client who was a medical doctor uh, with a young son. Um, she, she had met this person on Facebook, uh, done video calls with him. He was a surgeon from, allegedly a surgeon from UK. Again, have, he, he was also having a young daughter. So there were interactions between the families also. So it was that real and eventually he, she was asked to transfer money because he wanted to come to India and then some, some of his money had got stuck, some of his parcels had got stuck in customs and you know, he, she kept on and on and giving money till you finally real, realize that it has was, this whole thing was a big scheme. Uh, another very common and now this, is, this is perhaps the commonest what we have seen in the last six months is where you have pre-approved loans. So there is a concept of PAPL, which is a pre-approved personal loan. So if, if you're in a certain bracket of, you know, the transactions in your account are of a certain level, uh, the bank will offer you a PAPL. How many of you are aware that you already have a pre-approved loan in your account? No, we get a lot of offers, a lot of mails on this PAPL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, loans. yeah, so now this is customer service. You know, you're one of their chosen customers and they're ready to give you a loan at, you know, at an instant. What fraudsters are doing is, uh, by some, so it starts by saying that uh, we have a parcel under your name. Uh, the call is from FedEx and we've got drugs in that parcel. So would you like to know more? And you say, no, no, I've never sent a parcel. But you said, okay, but do you want to know more about it? So press zero or press one. The, the moment you do that, the phone is transferred to a police investigating agency. It could be a CBI or some fa very fancy name. And uh, then you are asked to uh, talk about uh, what you do and uh, whether you've sent any parcel and you keep denying everything. And the and it's a whole setup. You There's a video call in which you can actually see a real police officer with identity cards and credentials in place. And they say, okay, you don't want to do, uh, give an interview on video, fine. So in the next 24 hours, please come and report to a police station in, in somewhere in the north or somewhere in, right in the south where you are in Pune. And you say, oh, no, no, I don't want to travel. So I am ready to, to cooperate on a video call. 
on the video call you're threatened with police action and all sorts of things and you end up giving your bank id password because the police are saying that let let us examine what are the transactions in your account to ensure that you are not part of a money mule racket see this, this is always very believable for that person especially a person who says i don't want to get embroiled in a case where i am not guilty and then you're thinking of how the indian police system works and i may just get caught up in some sort of a criminal investigation i was never part of Vaishali, I got this call five times last month and they said uh, we are from FedEx and you have sent a parcel to Thailand which has narcotics, whatever, mm. whatever. And I did press one but then I realized that I had to send it to the I switched off my phone. But I got it five times. Finally, I went to Mr. Koper Digger and I told him, he was like, hey, you have to send it to the And he yeah. was the first time, on second legs. time you are frightened. So um, now, yeah, because, because now you better. I sent the parcel uh, by FedEx, and that number must have got leaked, you know, okay. through whomever. But when they said the date as whatever 15th April, I knew I had not sent anything on 15th April. But if they would have given me the right date, I would have really thought somebody has planned it like that. So it becomes so real, uh, and I don't know how to. I mean, I had the number, but I forgot to save the number. You know, I'll come to that, you know, how to even report yeah. such numbers where you've not really been defrauded, but there's an attempt to defraud. Yeah. So now, just going a little ahead in this case, that once you're on the video call, you've already shared credentials, you've already shared your login ID password, not only you lose the money that you have, so let's say you have about 5 lakhs in your account, that is lost because they have access, but now they are approving the pre-approved loan, which is available on your account, so you have a 50 lakh credit in two seconds mm -hmm. and you have a 50 lakh debit in 10 transactions immediately. Now this is a double whammy for the mm -hmm. victims. Uh, another thing that what we are speaking to the banks ab about is how come that there are no checks and balances in the PAPL that gets approved in a Jiffy. So the bank's response is that it is done through an authorized uh, ID password sometimes an OTP is also shared, the OTP is also shared by the victim to the fraudsters again but we are again you know fighting now with the banks to have better checks and balances for PAPLs but right now this is the reality that not only it is a scam where your ID password is being shared and your actual money is lost but there is a loan now on your head so now you also have the bank after you for repayment of that loan. That is a real, real, really a very troublesome area. Excuse me. Yes. This PAPL scam, whatever is there. I mean, it's. I believe it's the bank's practice for 75 years and above. Retired people, they don't give loans or credit cards. So how do these mails come to us? That's true, mm -hmm. sir. I mean, it, it, sir. It, it, the bank who has to filter it out. You know? Exactly. So now the rather. So we have found a lot of loopholes in which the bank. So if you actually go to the bank to file a, a claim or a dispute for a credit entry, they don't have a procedure in place. So now I'm, what am I complaining about that there is a 50 lakh credit in my account, I want to raise a complaint and I want to block my account immediately. They don't have a system for it. They have a system for a debit entry. So if I say, oh, I've lost two lakhs and th then the, the system sort of the, the automated system kicks in place. So these are certain lacunas that now we are looking at. You know, so, uh, I have asked many of the banks that how did you get my number to, mm -hmm. to ring me and they have a kind of pool in which they are sharing numbers with each other uh, which is absolutely illegal I am sure. Yes. Yes. But it does happen and that is how a lot of these scams originate you know from a pool where all the numbers are coming in. That's because right. how does, uh, if I have an account in HDFC, how does a State Bank get my number? Absolutely. You know, where I don't have an, an account. So, uh, if time permits, I'm going to come to that because we also have a Digital Data Protection Act now by which these financial institutions will be held liable. In fact, on one of my groups, we had a lovely image getting circulated that there's a Bhail Puri packet and the, the paper of the Bhelpuri packet is a customer, uh, you know, the, the form of some very high profile bank in which you get the Bhelpuri getting served. Like all your data is on, on that uh, paper of the Bhelpuri. 
so yeah that's the level of data privacy that we have but we do have a legislation in place and that's a lot of burden i say a lot of responsibility on us to actually invoke these legislations so that we make complaints to the right authorities for data protection because again personal data protection has never been part of our culture we're freely giving away data even at petrol pumps and you know we're filling up forms at public places even something as simple as you getting entry into a hotel how many of you share your mobile number when you know you enter and say yeah. There is no reason why you don't need a retail outlet yeah. asks you for a yeah, but, at the bill. But you can refuse, you can right? No, you can actually refuse. refuse. They want they your say, mobile, mobile number. number. No, so no. say no because uh, the service is not cannot be linked to your mobile number. And those mobile numbers are the spoon yes. which is getting sold. Now yes. every mobile number is. Asking for mobile number is a. I mean, it's that serious. It is no, that. No, there is there is a wrong number. There is a star bus. You are saying the one time. What's the mobile number? So give a wrong number. So I so I'll come to that because again this will be a very wide discussion otherwise. Just say no. No, but even if. But you know, there is another thing that happens which I have noticed that. Say a relationship manager, they seem to go from bank to bank, mm. and a lot of the personal data is known to them. So, uh, bank A, the relationship manager goes to bank C, and he carries a lot of the personal data, whether he writes it or he remembers, I don't know. But this keeps on happening. It's a kind of closed circuit that happens. You know, so let's let's look at it in 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 another way. See, there are some ways. on which there are some places over which we don't have control right now for example this data getting circulated it is going to take time for the law to come in for the culture to be built for penalties to be given to banks so that they haul up their employees to not do this the moment one large bank is penalized for miss say 4% of their profit under the dpdp act that time the bank is going to wake up and tell their employees that you will not share data but till that time we have to live in this reality that data is porous we ourselves are giving our data our data so much voluntarily that the time will come when we will be holding the intermediaries or the financial institutions accountable but as of today what we need to do is we need to be the protector of our own data and be very very selective in what we do and how we share and with whom we share and even ask for destruction so if you are not part of that organization anymore you can actually request that organization that please delete all the personal information that you have in your custody with a written confirmation to me so i think that sort of vigilance would not only help us but also make the institutions aware uh, of the data and the value of the data that they are handling so let us want aadhar and pan together a lot of people want your aadhar details they want your pan card details so again on aadhar aadhar is can be asked by only specific entities which have been named either in the aadhar act or by separate no notifications so mm -hmm. i was once giving a lecture on employers uh, obligations under the data digital personal data protection act so i asked most of the employers who were sitting i said how many of you take aadhar card from your employees mm -hmm. so it is there or we all takes so i said under what provision do you take aadhar card or aadhar number is there any, is there a reason for you to take the aadhar number said so, no no it's just part of our form so you can take an aadhar number if you are processing their epfs or you need it for insurance processing because under the insurance act there is a notification under the provident fund act there is a notification but a hotel cannot ask for aadhar card cannot insist on aadhar card so that is the level of awareness you and me need to have earlier we are relatives when i check in in hotel yeah. in where i am getting yeah. Don't give. Yes. What should I do? Go, give your driver's license. Yeah, driver's license. Yes, yes, yes. Give your driver's license. Give an ID where there is no consequence. Yes, yes, a photo ID. ID. You yeah. need a photo ID. Then I will give my liquor permit. That is a big thing. Liquor permit. Yeah, of course. Yes, a photo. I think so. Let's go to the next question. Otherwise, we're like one will lead to another. Just one. I would like to add. When you mention all kinds of people ask for that. 
hospitals are hospitals are not available now yeah. we have we have what is in the hospital it was not an emergency so we could fight it out fedex is to ask for the yeah. other if you have to send a parcel yeah. Yeah. now fedex in india i have fought for about a week and finally fedex has stopped it mm-hmm. but the point is it, it takes a lot of your energy it does to fight this and uh, why can't the hospitals be back from it yeah. it, it mm-hmm. does so i mean coming to that the penalty for doing something like this is right now not well defined and till that is see we all know that we all are better behaved when we are watched so unless and until that watch is not there and unless and until it doesn't translate into a penalty nobody is going to do the compliance on their own unfortunately so yeah. we are hoping for the legislations to bring in these penalties for asking for de- so now uh, under the dpdp act it is said that if you so there is a concept of data um uh, it's uh, it's called uh, where you data minimization where you ask only the only enough data that you need to process so once we had this discussion on so all forms have a title right so ms mrs mr and then your name so i had raised a question that why so it it reveals a lot right ms mr mrs it reveals a lot about your status of a relationship so why is it necessary to have that even as a data item in the forms sometimes it could be age not necessary if you really don't require the age for giving the service if you are if you are ordering on amazon or any other uh, uh, you may not require to enter the age or male female mm-hmm. it's, it's it is it is irrelevant to buying a product on amazon yeah so those concepts have been introduced now in the law so if you are there if any entity is asking for data which is more than what is required for processing they will be held up under the data digital uh, data protection act and the penalties are really large the penalties are equated to the the profit that they are making and in the percentage of the profit they are making and the, these are actions that will be taken by the data protection board which will be a specially constituted board under the act so and uh, what about mobile companies asking for they are supposed to ask for all the so under the te- telecom Re- regulatory authority guidelines uh, asking for a aadhar is not mandatory it is by mobile companies also so you know you have a right to refuse and but as ev- everybody is saying that it's an effort most of the time we say who has the time to do all this just let me give this and finish it off but that that you know they are not they are not authorized to ask for it when you give your other you can uh, there is a provision that is blur the thing or you put a, a watermark on it and yes. then give it you are but you know for the biometrics they they ask because oh, two weeks back i just got my sim changed and they said i want other and said main nahi dungi kya karne wale karo mujhe mere ko sim chahiye nahi to main jaungi police i just gave i didn't know but i just told them finally they only took my number instead of they wanted the print out which yeah. i refused to do and so that yeah. because of those calls that i received <laughs> otherwise i would not have done. yeah so uh, so vaishali uh, you spoke a lot elaborately on different kind of, uh, of frauds that can happen uh, we also had a uh, as you attended last time of uh, mr nath kumar sir yes so he also spoke on these financial frauds so um, i have a question that in case you gave examples of banks also so in case so people lose their money uh, does the bank take any uh, what do you say responsibility of paying yes. them back or yes. refunding them and uh, how do they handle this this kind of uh, problems in the economy right very valid question also so all uh, banks are regulated by the rbi so rbi came out with a notification saying that zero liability on customers for under three circumstances so the circumstances which have been mentioned in the circular are when there is no negligence of the customer so the negligence can lie anywhere else 
the negligence can lie with the bank the negligence can lie with the third party the negligence can lie outside the customer then the bank has to refund the entire amount and if it does not do that then you can file a case before the rbi ombudsman and get get and apply for the refund so what the bank started doing is for the moment you uh, make a complaint to the bank they will give you a shadow credit they will say okay we are internally investigating what all has happened and whether you have been victim of a phishing fraud whether you have on your own given credit credentials uh, if if that is not the case and if the negligence is not on your part then we are ready to refund the whole money most of the banks do honor this and they are backed by insurances now which again you know we have to pay a certain amount to cover their insurance but so be it but at least because of the insurance uh, the zero liability circular is getting implemented but the catch is that there has to be no negligence from the customer yes. and through the last moment. now most of the times most of the times and i have So I've seen also in my career that most of the times the the fault does lie with the customer. So either there is a phishing attack, you you are uh, you've clicked on some link, you've downloaded some software, you've shared some credentials. So there is a fault that ha- that is with you and you on your. So for the bank, look at look at it from the bank's angle. It is an authorized transaction for them. It comes from an authorized uh, ID and password. and a, even a ot now if you say but i had lost control over my cell phone and there was my sim card was cloned so those are also very very common cases mm-hmm. most of the times the banks are ready to honor this provided it gets proved that the sim card is cloned or a duplicate sim card was issued to the fraudster at that same time or the time duration the fraud took place but that is subject to investigation the banks will refund the money because the fault now lies outside your purview or outside your uh, uh, jurisdiction or outside your control even if partially you are able to prove that it was the bank's um, fault for example uh the banks are under a uh, again they are they have a guidelines of cyber having adequate cyber security controls in place so for example they need to do transaction monitoring another example of a transaction monitoring is that if there are a uh, very quick large value debits in an account very successive large value debits in an account also at a very uh, unreasonable hour let's say at 3 am which is not a normal time that you would have operated the account looking at your operational history the bank should have stepped in the bank on its own should have done something so we call it, it is called as a velocity check so the banks are under a guideline to look at the velocity check or the banks are also uh, under a guideline to look at uh, what is the purpose of this you, the this money for example if it's a uh, and i'll come to that case if it's a um, corporate account used for education purpose let's say it's an academic institution money is for education purpose and if the money is getting transferred into hedge funds this should have alerted the bank to stop those transfers at least give a call to the account holder saying that are you really doing these transactions do you really want me to authorize these transactions so irregular transactions uh, transactions which are not no it would done in the ordinary course of how you would have used that bank account there is a rbi guideline which talks about how bank should function there so there is a certain um, obligation given to the banks when it looks at these forms of transaction but most of the times and i i'll repeat this most of the time for the bank this will appear as a authorized transaction should i just uh, should, should i just still complete la one point me answer your question this we also look at what we call as the business email compromise frauds a uh, very typically uh, in an in an organization you may get let's say generally the account manager will get an email from a managing director saying that i need to you to transfer so so many lakhs to some account managing director say email hai so then the accounts manager generally would do that so for the bank it is authorized 
because the accounts manager is legitimately accessing the account, legitimately trans transferring. Now the managing director is saying, but I never sent you that email. So for the bank, so sometimes because most of the time the clients come to us and say, we want to sue the bank, we want to sue the bank, like, fine. But you know, in these cases, it's really not the bank's fault. Provided, now we are suing one bank for the case that I just mentioned, that if an amount residing in the account of an educational institution is being transferred for the purpose of buying stocks or in a hedge fund, the bank should have been more alert than what it did. Sometimes banks also are, are very, very negligent. They, they, in one of our cases, they've authorized transactions which are more than the limit of authorization. So these are where you can make the bank liable to pay. Uh, but that is, will be, you know, it's very fact-based when it comes to a case. See, the, the problem is that everything need not have a law. I'll give you a good example. So I went to my bank and I said, you know, I have all my transactions. And then I have UTI so all that, and you know, that comes within the, so all that I said is, why don't you have a buffer? Like for example, for any digital transaction, you have a buffer. where you say, 10,000 rupees is your digital interface. That means nothing, you know, all this password and this and that, that is my digital protection. And rest of it goes offline. But they don't want to do it. Now, immediately when I asked him, he, he comes and says, sir, start a new account. New, this, my, my life has become more miserable because now I have to start a new account in which then he links my UPI to this new account. So now, if I have to look at UPI, I have to log into this account. But at least it's good because now I've locked off yes, this part of the account. Yes. So there are some things that the bank can do. Everything will not be a damn law from the RBI and you know, because I don't know when RBI is going to wake up. Only when probably the governor is on account gets hacked. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, but you know, this is, these governors wake up only when you know, they get affected. They don't relate to our problems. Yeah, so, I mean, having said what you have said, uh, Financial, the financial industry is right now very highly regulated and they do have their checks and balances in place. Uh, on, on the other hand, we also want ease of operation. We want UPI, you know, we want digital banking, we want internet banking. Can I come in here? Yes. Uh, all UPI transactions and uh, related to banking and all that, when you open an account, you can set your limits. Yes. Yeah. By yourself. Yeah. For UPI or for other payments or this thing or for not transferring yes. to uh, bank accounts or whatever, there are checks and balances which you only can operate through the software. Even for so the credit card. Even for the credit card, even for the debit okay, card. Okay, now the question is how many people do it? So the point is we will not make aware. See the point over here. No, is another that? point what he's trying to make is, see the default setting would be maximum. So why not make the default setting low so that you are forced to. It is to, other way around. So the default you're setting to. is low. Yes. Now what is happening is the default setting is low. Yes. You have to increase it. Enable. That, enable, yeah, it. enable. that is yes. what is. Yeah. Uh, yes. The phone calls come for that. At least the HDFC is there. Uh, all, 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 Number, phone number, which I did, and then I went into a scam. Fortunately, the amount was small, and I paid one amount from a credit card, the other from a debit card. Credit card immediately checked with me, the bank. And I said, Stop it, don't give that. The debit card didn't check, and they gave them. Later on, when I discovered this, I went to the cyber police. So I filled up the form and then they, I applied to Reserve Bank saying this will happen. And that bank which had honored the debit card without checking with me 
refund them the money. So this is yeah. And, and now as a policy, I don't press any links. <laughs> I just don't press it unless I phone and check. Yeah, I mean, no, I I the question I that comes to my mind is, yeah. since when did, uh, you know, our phone companies and MSCB then become yeah. so, like, alert that now they're sending us SMSs, like, yeah, it's a... No, but there, there is no, one... I, issue. I never read a press that, uh, you know, these gangs have been busted. No, they have been. Yeah. Lot of in fact, really they have been. So, yeah. not only the Indian uh, syndicates, but now the, the recent syndicates are operating from Cambodia and yeah. Southeast mm. Asian countries yeah. and yeah. there's a lot of uh, investigation going on. So, yes. on, on the same similar lines... Uh, just search for Bharatpur, no, Rajasthan, there are three or four places, you'll find hundreds of uh, articles where these uh, gangs have been busted. But unfortunately, the nexus between these gangs and the police rather than modern one, these police, there's a lot of corruption there. So, they are there inside and after some time, they just pay off and they're let out. That's the problem. That's a different matter. But they are indeed caught nowadays, that's for sure. But I am told one of the biggest rewards are operated from Paris. Yeah, yes, crazy. this is according to yes, somebody yes, who is an expert at, uh, according at uh, to the busting the these. Who, who and he says the word of words in you Paris know, that's sir, the I'm maximum I am sorry to market. interrupt all of you here. I mean, see, this is all in a way coffee table talk. Uh -huh. The gangs busted. For you and me, Right. That little money that we have in our account I is agree. important. Absolutely. So what that. the investigating agencies yeah, do, what the law. So I think I always tell like wherever awareness programs that I do that these are you know very like high level discussions as to what the law should be mm -hmm. and how the police officer should do. Please take care of your own money by just being alert. And I'm not saying don't use UPI, don't mm -hmm. use digital transactions, don't use internet because that is the order of the day mm -hmm. and that is going giving you so much of ease and your life has become so much simpler. But with these little checks and balances in place, like initially uh, uh, we used to blank off the CVVs from our credit card, card and debit, debit card because that was your, you know, key Give to... So, but we readily used to give our debit cards and credit cards to waiters and Marriott then faced that. But we were not vigilant to, to blacken that out. <coughs> or even today, I see so many people filling up forms with birth dates and your mo mobile numbers. That birth date and the forms that you fill up, those are the questions that are used to reset your passwords. So, just being aware and just being a little more alert will save you from a lot of trouble. Greed. I, I, and that is why I started with greed. Most of the clients who come to us have lost money because they have invested in schemes for making more money. Now somebody who is promising you 24% of interest and you lose money, you don't even have sympathy from others, right? <laughs> but no, I, you know, I, I want yeah. your advice on one thing. You know, this recently happened with me. I was traveling abroad and I got a message that my credit card has been used for a transaction for 15,000 years. So, have you authorized it? So, I said no. And it had given at 8.45 p.m. at this store, this has been done. So, I said no. So, for the sake of good order, since I was traveling abroad, I didn't get a message. I said, let me call up the help center. And when I called them up, he heard me out and he said, sir, let me check everything after doing my and he said, sir, your uh, card has been temporarily blocked. And the good news is that this transaction was not blocked. Mm. So I said, so what do I do now? So he said, I would advise you that you permanently block it. Yes. In such time that you come back. Yes. So I said, okay, please do it. You know, but I said, how do I know that how has this happened? So he said, sir, that you will have to talk to someone else. Since I was traveling abroad, by the time I reached home, I found that they have unblocked my car without talking to me. So, uh, what, what should I do? Because earlier it was that, how could have this taken place? That uh, my so credit know, card uh, number. About the, that so, so, I see I'm a lawyer, so I will answer what the law is about. So, the law says that every bank should have a customer grievance officer and that the name of the customer grievance officer has to be displayed on the website of the bank and there is a certain way in which there is an escalation matrix which has been given and the RBI uh, monitors this. There is an internal RBI ombudsman, uh, internal ombudsman with all the banks.
bank. There is a customer grievance redresser forum that all the banks have. So I would urge you to use that uh, escalation matrix. File a formal written complaint. Uh, escalate it, and if it does not get resolved within the bank, please go to the ombudsman. File, and all these are free proceedings, yes. so you don't need a lawyer for it. You need, to, you just need to file it through the escalation matrix, and even before the RBI digital ombudsman, the filing is online without payment of any court fee or court fee stamp. But you can take it to the logical end. Mm. No, there, there is one way of uh, we travel a lot. Uh, especially Southeast Asia, you ask the bank that I'm going from so-and-so date to so-and-so date. Please cover my card. They will give you a covering number. Okay. So when the moment you go to your card, the card doesn't reflect that number. It re reflects the double number. Okay. And then the fraudsters are not aware of it because it is only limited to one or two people in the bank and then they cover it, number one. Number two, what they also do is, as she explained, that uh, they have a uh, personal kind of history of what you actually purchase. Mm -hmm. So once it happened to me in Thailand, when they, somebody wanted to buy a two-wheeler on my card early in the morning, moment that happened, I had given them a warning that anything about 10,000 rupees, you please refer back to me. So the, they blocked it, referred back to me, and that transaction never took place. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the third thing is, check your account every day. This is what I do. <laughs> okay, so there are checks and balances on, on in this, place. I think we should move ahead. Uh, on this note... Um, One last question. Then. Yeah, yeah, actually last you can... Um, okay, okay. One small. I, my, one of my daughters, she's a finance person. She has said, Daddy, never pay anything by debit card because you have no recourse. You always pay by credit card because in credit card, you can always question and then... That's good advice. Some. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's good advice. So on the exactly same note, uh, the question is that uh, we are talking a lot about the different type of crimes. On other side, the younger generation, which is in the domain of, let's say, 14, 13, 12, 13, 14, to, let's say, 25 to 30. All these uh, are extremely savvy with the mobile phones. Uh, eventually, when we talk to somebody for our grievance, I'm sure the person is in the 20s and 25, 30. So, do you see that this younger generation, which is hooked onto the mobile phone, they are also susceptible to or they are prone to uh, in getting involved in such kind of cyber crimes. Okay, um, so, um, okay, let me again in a, a mm. little bit of a different perspective. Mm. So we all are struck, we always struggled with digital technology because yeah. we, it was new for us. for them for all for all of us these problems exist for them it doesn't because they are part of the system yes. and they are so much more aware and they're so much more uh, savvy savvy uh, now having said that they would know how to use that technology very well mm -hmm. but finally it it all boils down to human interaction so what I see so we this age group is all concerned about financial frauds you go the lower the age group, they're more concerned about social media crimes, trolling, sexual mm -hmm. harassment, uh, making fake profiles, stalking, uh, pedophiles, mm -hmm. uh, 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 all, all forms of sexual harassment online. So that is where the, the children are more susceptible. And the biggest gap that I have found, and, and I, all this comes from the cases that I have seen, so one day, one uh, uh, old friend of mine, a college friend of mine had called me very worried and uh, he was he was telling me that, you know, I know somebody, somebody's son, uh, he's got involved in some form of a sexual racket and he's giving out money and we're very concerned. So what is, so I said, uh, is, he, is he your son? And he said, yeah, it's actually my son. So I said, you come, come to office, so let's have a chat with you, your son and get your wife along and let's see what we can do. So the son was telling me that uh, I had joined a dating site uh, where they had promised that there will be a girl who will come and spend the day with me. So like an escort, mm 
uh, no sexual relations were you know even discussed but one nice good looking girl will be there with me for the day and i had to pay some amount for it so he had paid subscription amount 1500 rupees and then another amount of 2500 rupees so that he can spend the day with her he said actually when the day came i panicked one evening before i panicked and i cancelled my subscription and i said i'm sorry you know i i thought i wanted to do this but i don't so i want to cancel this subscription so please refund my money so they said uh, yes we are initiating the refund process and you may have to pay another another 1500 so that you know we do our internal account so he said okay i'm giving you another 1500 and then they wanted another 25000 uh, then he, they said because if you now don't pay we will file a case against you because you had you wanted to you know spend this time with a girl unknown girl and we don't know what your intentions were that is when he panicked because he thought what he was doing is wrong and eventually he paid 25000 and for that other 25000 since he didn't have he had gone to some uncle chacha to borrow that money and that is how the the elders in the family came to know about it and the the his his mother was crying and how did my son do this and i cannot believe our upbringing was like this and i said why are you giving so much importance to him being on a dating site you ask like any 45 50 year old today he is on a dating site despite he or she is on a dating site despite them being married that is the culture that we are in and everybody is behaving as if they are not part of it mm-hmm. and like cyber crime investigators would know how many of people uh, of men and women in pune who otherwise would have a very fancy uh, 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 recognition in 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 the society are on some dating site in uh, available online so giving so much importance to that had driven the boy away from the parents and made him do things that that he felt so guilty about so i think it's their age to explore mm-hmm. they are bound to do these things on the internet our dialogue with them as it perhaps is what is most important uh, there are laws in place mm-hmm. there are very very stringent laws in place laws in place where the minors are protected against sex all forms of sexual harassment online uh, where uh, stalking is prohibited under ipc intermediary liabilities have been defined so that the the intermediary that is the social media companies are under an obligation to take down material which is sexually offensive or which uh, can uh, be sexually offensive to a certain victim or is showing that victim in in a bad light all those provisions are in place and that is possible so though we do do see that the social media crimes uh, which involves youngsters are really on the rise because what is happening uh, would have happened otherwise in the physical space is happening now in the online space much easier to do mm-hmm. and what we talk to the youngsters is we are not telling them don't do this we are telling them that you are creating a digital footprint and a digital evidence which is very very easy to capture if you are doing this offline you know if you are stalking a girl offline in college there won't be much evidence yeah. but to do the same thing online you are going to leave a trail of evidence and that awareness is what is that required that is a very the, very you know. important point <laughs> your risk <laughs> okay so i mean it is financial i think we should move on so you know i mean how do you tell the youngsters otherwise yeah. not to do it when you ourselves we have indulged in so many wrong acts when we were in in the in our younger age yeah, yeah, or yeah. even now perhaps a personal issue so i've helped my father recover some of his money i've helped or my friends recover their uh, social media accounts my accounts have been uh, hacked uh, the main thing that i the main challenge i face in this is how do i regulate my emotions why is it happening and i would like maybe call them like peak moments when like your your friends are aware of accounts <laughs> and also like generally when you are aware of it but it's not happening to you directly so then you are a little more relaxed with your foot, digital footprint so how do you like because either it's like extreme fear and paranoia like you can super paranoid or then you are like really relaxed so how, like how do i regulate my emotions yeah i wish you know i had a nice answer for that 
uh, I'm not qualified to answer your, uh, to give an answer for your question. Perhaps a psychiatrist or a psychologist would be in a better position to do that. Uh, but what I feel is that this um, because the use itself is unregulated right from childhood. No one has a clue as to what should be the optimum screen time, how it should be regulated, transparency in what children are doing, what parents are doing and transparency works both ways, both right? Ways, yeah. uh, so it can't be just one way, just can't expect children to tell you what they're doing online when you are not telling what you are doing online. So I think that is where the problem is and that is why uh, by the time the youngsters are on their own on social media, uh, they have not been adequately equipped to deal with social media challenges and as you said very raw emotions it's not just happening with youngsters I see so many cases of elderly people like my age friends call up for cases that their father or their mother have got embroidered and they're so embarrassed to even describe that case because there's cases of sextortion cases where you know uh, they have downloaded material on the internet and now they're getting extortion threats because they've indulged into some sort of pornographic um, exercise or even a sexual chat with some unknown lady on the net so it's not just youngsters it's across and we all are still facing a very unregulated emotion on the internet because none of us are actually equipped to to deal with that so i think we have uh, we have had a very very good discussion we have almost Can gone I to the a small point for this yeah, okay a, yeah because i i've been learning on it uh, see all whatever we have discussed and whatever we have this thing all this boils down uh, this thing is uh, cyber security, uh, software related uh, industry, which in India is still at the infancy, infancy stage. That was my that, actually last yeah. uh, final question to, to Advocate Vaishali that uh, if at all, since PIC is a think tank and since we mostly work on you know policies and recommendations. What would be your uh, kind of recommendations, three recommendations, five recommendations to the Indian government if they have to implement a kind of a policy to make this entire thing more regulatory and more strict, stringent and more indigenous also. Because we are always worried, for example, when we do GPay, uh, actually I am also worried that which server in which country is doing these transactions for me. Is it all secured? So hmm. what would be your recommendations okay. as a lawyer? Respond to the GP and money on the yeah. server. So RBI came up with a direction to all financial institutions saying that all payment data has to be localized. So payment data of any Indian citizen will not go on a foreign server. So we already have that regulation in place. So what has happened right now in India is we have see an Information Technology Act came in 2000 when e-commerce was you know just coming. There was this e-commerce boom at that time. So the law was designed to regulate e-commerce transactions but over the period of 25 years we all have realized that the law is getting used more to regulate cyber crimes than e-commerce so it went through many amendments every two three years the law got amended so it's becoming a, a bit of a patchwork so it act as of today is like like a patchwork document mm -hmm. and so if you have to go and look for a certain <coughs> provision for a for a question that is is bothering all of us it becomes difficult because i not only have to look under it act 2000 i may have to look under the indian penal code so it is scattered mm -hmm. we also have a lot of sectoral legislation so you have uh, uh, insurance are governed by irdi you will have mutual fund companies by sebi you will have financial institutions by rbi you have uh, hospitals and uh, patient data getting regulated by uh, the health ministry under special specific guidelines which have been issued but so it's very you know peaceful here yeah, and there yeah, yeah. so with the digital india act coming in which will come in the near future we feel it should come in the next couple of years 
all this will be con consolidated under one legislation making it more robust and making it uh, from a point of view of the issues that you and me are facing as customers as i said the earlier legislations were not for that earlier legislations much later in 2018 the intermediaries uh, got regulated so otherwise it was a free fall for intermediaries till 2018 google could walk away with anything and social media companies were walking away with 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 absolutely no re regulation in fact all our investigations used to come to a standstill if you ask google for ip address mm -hmm. they would say us privacy laws will not allow us to disclose and that was the end of the investigation and now if you remember they were all compelled to have a grievance officer appointed in india and then there was a big row uh, uh, but because now india is ready to put their foot down and say if you want to especially significant social media intermediaries if you want to operate in india you have to comply with the law of the land and so the landscape is ch changing we already are hoping for the digital india act to come in which is a very robust legislation which will do away with, with all the lacunae and it will come out for public consultation so i think at that time i'm sure pic will have a role to play okay. where in the public consultation we will be able to give our recommendations and our response to the legislation that comes out uh you know, the dpdp act is already out but the rules are yet to be notified the rules also will come out for public consultation so if we can contribute there too i think that would be an important contribution from all of us to see how to make uh the cyber ecosystem of india robust mm -hmm. unfortunately the national cyber security policy is a document in pdf online available online which was released in 2013 and the posture is very defensive it's about time we had an offensive cyber security policy an offensive posture covering our cyber space so that it's not only that we are there to thwart attacks but we should be in a position to if required Retail. attack Retail. Retail. yeah or even initiate an attack if yeah. if required yes thank yeah, you yeah. so thank much thank you so much uh, i mean uh, is there anything you want just one yeah sure sure you see what happened some of our shares in the company disappeared we check our demand every day the holding statements it disappeared then i contacted and wrote an email to the company secretary and compliance officer there is no reply from i tried to go to the ombudsman and the site is such that i can't get get to the ombudsman do you Now, need a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> this this company officer this uh, they are located in bombay i was thinking of uh, going there So, to the office and demand the an explanation. Sir. No, I, I, I the I office of the demand account. Can know? we take this offline for no. lunch now? This we can session. do that. Yeah. We can do that. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. just to answer his immediate, sir. Sir, in a demand account, uh, your shares cannot be yeah. go out from your account just like that, unless and until you have given them or. अभय विल अग्री दिस हेज बीन वन ऑफ द फर्स्ट अड्डा 
such an informal discussion. Absolutely. It has yeah. it has never yes. been. It's actually an adda today. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the format of Very the book matters. matters. It is round table. It does matter. In yeah. DMTC, it's like a presentation. So it, you know the participation is round. Yeah. So the, the I'm, I'm really matters. sad that Deepak is not there to you know uh, <laughs> listen to this. So let's thank you. Thank uh, thank uh, thank you. Thank you so much.